Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Zhenya Bakken. I'm a language teacher and teacher trainer. Uh, I'm based in Moscow, but I travel around and I'm very much excited about this marathon I'm taking part in. Actually, this is not my first marathon because my, my first marathon I did some 10 years ago in the US and was a real marathon. Now it's going to be different slightly. No running, just uh, talking and trying to uh, unfold the, the question of speaking. So today we'll be talking about how to teach speaking and uh, uh, this is a quick plan for today. Uh, oh yeah, before I move on to my slides, uh, I just want to let you know that uh, you can watch us now on YouTube and Facebook and also of Contacta and I think this recording will be available. Uh, so if it's late night hour for you now, if you're based in Vladivostok, for example, and don't, don't, don't watch it uh, in the middle of the night. You go to bed and in the morning you will find it on YouTube. All right, let's start. So uh, how to teach speaking. Uh, today we'll, uh, we'll, I will mention a few things. First of all, uh, I'll talk about what the skill of speaking is and we'll see how you can actually um, focus on different sub-skills and different aspects of speaking and what makes the skill of speaking and what is important uh, in speaking preparation. And also uh, we think about problems a learner might have and experience uh, when uh, completing or when going through a speaking task and then uh, uh, Clearly, uh, I'll talk about how we teachers can help this learner. And uh, uh, to, to make your life a bit easier, I've prepared a lesson plan with a few stages, which you can adopt to different levels and different age groups. And uh, this is gonna be uh, towards the end of the session today. And finally, there will be a slide on potential pitfalls, something which you might find <laughs> less useful and you want you might want to avoid uh, in in your own teaching okay there will be a few videos from my classroom from my students and from other teachers as well uh, including international teachers let's see how it goes uh, feel free to add comments on youtube if uh, if you're watching this live stream uh, then uh, uh, somebody will be collecting these questions and redirecting them to me so i will address this uh, these questions as soon as i can okay so the first point, so the first step today, the first question, what do we mean when we say speaking? What is it speaking? Uh, to start, I will show you a quick speaking task. Take a look, 20 seconds. A standard task, isn't it? You have a task, you have three bullet points, you have time limit. You've seen many of this. You've seen in Cambridge tasks, you've seen them in Yega. It's it's all uh, it's all in the market. We have we have seen a lot of tasks like this. But actually, a big question is what type of uh, sub skills or what type of information or what type of uh, activities does a learner need to demonstrate or produce while completing this task? What, what uh, do learners need to consider when going through these tasks, when completing these tasks successfully? These tasks successfully. Okay. And there are quite a few things actually. But first of all, you need to consider, of course, the main idea. What you are trying to say, what you wanna say, the, the main message, your, uh, your answer to this question. By the way, uh, all these concepts, all these considerations, they will be true for any speaking activity, any speech act, any task, any language. So if you teach some other language, uh, let it be uh, Russian or, uh, I don't know, uh, Swahili or maybe Portuguese. So uh, these aspects will be true for, for speaking activities as well. So uh, conceptual preparation, main idea, what is the answer? Second one would be macro planning. What do you want to say first? What do you want to say second? What comes towards the end of, uh, of, this, uh, of this speaking activity? Then communicative language choices. And this includes 
maybe questions, maybe some idioms, maybe some type of some specific type of language. Uh, if this is formal speech, you want to sound formal, and if you if it's informal speech uh, or chat or small talk with a friend, so you want to sound informal, and of course you need to adjust to your um, to the situation, and uh, there will be. Uh, formulation stage at some point when you're actually producing the uh, the, um, the words and phrases and sentences uh, when you are producing sounds using your vocal cords and organs of speech and what else you need to do of course there will be uh, syntactic choices and vocabulary choices and grammar choices individual sounds which you need to pronounce clearly uh, for example for Russian speakers of the English language you should clearly put your tongue between your teeth if you want to say I think so you don't want to say I think yeah uh, and of course we understand this as teachers but sometimes our learners need to uh, focus on this specifically uh, you need to demonstrate some features of connected speech, and this is also very important for uh, advanced levels or maybe up intermediate levels because you do not want to pronounce all the words in isolation. You don't want to say, uh, do not you like, do not you like uh, summer or do not you like music. Don't you like music, you want to say, and there's going to be some connection between these words. And this is what we call connected speech and students need to think about this as well at some point and make decisions. Of course, there will be grammar choices, have already mentioned that. Uh, register analysis, you cannot say hello to her majesty, but and cannot say probably hello to your boss. Uh, an appropriate, uh, an appropriate, a, a better phrasing here would be uh, good afternoon, okay? Uh, possibly it's okay with your boss if you are pals, uh, but if, when, um, uh, coming to a job interview, you don't want to say uh, what's up clearly. Monitoring is another aspect. Uh, while speaking, we constantly are checking uh, what, what we are saying and uh, it takes a lot of energy and uh, a lot of time actually. So there will be some, uh, some uh, that's what I'm doing right now. I'm going through self-repair. I'm looking for a word and I'm uh, looking for a better word. So I'm, I go back in, uh, in my message and I have a few retakes. Uh, of course, there will be recasts or retakes. Of course, there will be different strategies. Some people smile and slow down. Some people keep saying, okay, good, okay, good, when they're at lower levels. Uh, even if they don't understand much, they say, okay, good. And uh, the cost, of course, there will be consideration of timing, time pressure. How much time do you have to produce this or that piece of language? That's a lot, isn't it? And uh, I have just, just gone through basics and uh, actually all our learners and all of us, we need to go through all these aspects when we, when we are speaking. Some of this are automatized at some point, at some level, but for intermediate level learners or for uh, low level learners, all of this should be included into preparation stage. So let's break it into four big groups. Let's put this, all these aspects into four big groups. So if you think about speaking, it has four parts. First, you start with the conceptual preparation. This is your message, this is your idea, this is your community of language choices. Is it a friend? Is it a stranger? Is it an enemy? Uh, what are we saying? What, what should I say in this situation? Uh, what would be appropriate language? How do I say hello? How do I say bye-bye? Do I say goodbye? Do I say ciao? Do I say see you? Uh, what do I say? And this is all just conceptual, conceptual preparation, the idea. Second one would be actually formulation. How, which words do you need to take and how you put these words in order? What would be the string of words? What would be the string of phrases? Do I start with the subject or do I start with the verb? Do I need an auxiliary verb? Or what tense is it? Should it be past or maybe present? Or is it present perfect or is it past simple? Or is it a sentence with would? What happens after would? What type of verb do we need? Uh, do we, can we use progressive here or not? It's all about formulation, discourse choices, vocabulary, microplaning, and organization. So the first one is thinking. The first one is thinking more about grammar and vocabulary. Take a look, two stages without any word given. We haven't said a word, but we have 
done a lot of work. Not just we, but our students as well. We do this in our first language uh, um, uh, automatically. We don't think much about this conceptual preparation and formulation. But in our second language or third language, especially when we are at a lower level, we need to consider all these things. We need to think about this. And we teachers probably should, our, should let our students uh, should help our students and should let our students concentrate on these aspects one at a time. Now, the third stage is clearly articulation. And this is when you use your organs of speech, your voice cords, your hard palate, soft palate, your alveolar ridge, your, uh, your teeth, your tongue, your nasal cavity to produce different sounds. Whatever language it is, you are using your organs of speech to produce sound. And this is called articulation, the third stage. What comes next is monitoring. Having said something, you want to check yourself. Was it, was it okay, grammar-wise or meaning-wise? Uh, did I reach my goal with this message? Do I need to say it again, maybe? Did I make a mistake? If I made a mistake, do I want to repeat the sentence and correct it? Any recards? or I can see that my message was understood and I just want to move on. So this will be monitoring. Take a look, four stages, only one of them is actual articulation. And the rest is, as you can see, uh, the rest is just mental processes and it's processing. What can we do? A lot pressure is uh, taken by the students. That's a lot, a lot of challenge a lot of pressure and in this situation we can do quite a few things to help our learners so if you want to help your learner you should probably slow down a little bit and this is the first thing you need to do i believe that uh, pacing is very very important here at this stage uh, but there are a few more things you could you could do probably when you are you know, willing to help your learner and uh, these are some things let me see let me show you my slide So a couple of things. First of all, we need to be selective when choosing lesson aims. If you take a general aim, develop speaking, that's great. But you now could see that speaking has a lot of subskills and a lot of different uh, aspects. So we need to be very specific with, the, with your lesson aims. We'll come back to this. Uh, probably we should give enough free practice activities, and I'll talk about a bit later. And there will be... Uh, we should use communicative tasks to, uh, to make this experience communicative and authentic uh, experience of, uh, of speaking, of course. And the first one is, of course, one step at a time. One, why one step at a time? Uh, students need time to cope with all these uh, tasks the brain has when they are going through a speaking activity. This means that we need to slow down and maybe take one aspect at a time and wait until it's automatized. And later on, add another activity and then another activity and then another activity. You do not want to bombard your students with a lot of different tasks. Can, can, you, can you imagine uh, a novice teacher saying, okay, now go and prepare, a, give a presentation in front of the class. And this would be a nightmare for a student for, for many reasons, because maybe there is not enough vocabulary. Uh, a student doesn't know a lot of vocabulary. Or maybe because uh, uh, students is, is a bit shy. Maybe not enough knowledge of grammar, possibly. Uh, maybe uh, there are more things uh, psychological, or maybe the student is, cannot speak at length, because this is a, a novice. Uh, a, uh, low level learner, for example, or intermediate level learner. What would this mean? Probably a teacher should focus on one aspect uh, of the speaking activity at a time. Uh, we usually focus on vocabulary and grammar, and that's what we do a lot. And that's what you will find in the books a lot. But apart from that, quite a few things should be highlighted. For example, conceptual preparation, planning, pre-planning, uh, there could be strategies. We could teach our learners different strategies and uh, make sure that they can use these strategies. For example, a good strategy would be to write down a few words before you start speaking or write down what you're trying to say before you start speaking, if it's a question and if it's a phone call. If you're uh, giving a phone call, if you're talking over the phone and uh, you want to ask for something, make sure you write down your questions before you actually um, start calling somebody, okay? 
there are a few big ideas here. And uh, these ideas connect, these two ideas connected with their acquisition and learning dichotomy. And this is Stephen Krushen now you see on the screen. And Stephen Krushen is known uh, for, his, uh, for his few uh, uh, hypotheses. Uh, one of them uh, is, he, or Stephen Krushen says uh, that learning it does not equal uh, acquisition. So learning and acquisition are two different things. And he says that learning is about memorization. Uh, it's about uh, uh, rules which you memorize and you can recite but cannot use because acquisition, he says, is something else. Acquisition, this is how you take the language and use the language. And this is how you basically, basically intake the language. And he says there is a little problem because many teachers uh, are bit, a bit confused. And, this, and many teachers, as Krushen was saying, uh, he said that they, they believe that if you learn many words and learn many rules, automatically uh, you will acquire language. Stephen Krushen doesn't agree with that. That's his position. And this is something which he believes in. But you can, of course, say that uh, if uh, you explain a rule to a student and students knows how to put A, B, C together, then chances are high that the student will be putting it faster and faster and faster and eventually develop his language skills, including the speaking skill. In this light, uh, there are two basic views when you're thinking about speaking. And there would be accuracy-focused activity. And of course, uh, this is about correct grammar, correct pronunciation, correct form, uh, correct um, uh, speaking, correct vocabulary as well. And there would be fluency-focused activities. This is when students are given some um, opportunities to speak at length, to develop the flow of speech, to develop fluency. Which one would be easier for a teacher to set up? Of course, accuracy focus activity. Why? Is it to set up? Is it to check? Is it to explain? Is it to monitor? Uh, is it to take from the book? Uh, it could be a gap fill exercise, could be a substitution table. You just ask students, okay, you put an A and B together and tell me. It's, it, it's a bit easier and you can clearly see, and students as well can clearly see what's right and what's wrong in this accuracy focused activities. With fluency focused activities, this, this, is, this is different and this is a bit more difficult, but this is why we need a bit more focus on fluency uh, focused activities these days. From my experience, what I can see, teachers give a lot of accuracy-focused activities and students have a lot of drills and a lot of control practice, but fluency-focused activities, they do not show that often because partially because uh, teachers don't see a lot, of, uh, uh, a lot of value in this. Okay, so two views, accuracy-focused activities and fluency-focused activities. Take a look. I just put these activities into two groups. They are really different. Half a minute to finish. Okay. So as you can see, accuracy focused activities, that's about control, it's about right or wrong, that's about a particular rule, a particular word, a particular phrase which you want to hear in students' language, probably in speaking. But fluency focus is uh, it's a sort of improvisation. We don't know what kind of language will pop up, will emerge, as they say in professional literature, and students can actually select the language they use. So they have a lot of freedom, and uh, I don't think all of them will choose the language you want to hear from them. But fluency-focused activities are extremely important, I'm saying once again, because uh, they are very close to authentic speech. Uh, in real life, we do not uh, speak in uh, uh, controlled, blocked uh, phrases, sentences. Instead, we basically uh, give uh, improvisational uh, strings of, of words, improvisational phrases, trying to reach our goal, trying to get to the point we want to get to. All right, uh, let's move on. So if you think about uh, uh, accuracy-focused activities, uh, you think about practice, and this is called controlled practice. 
Yeah, and it's about rights or wrong. So student, uh, students have a lot of, con teachers have a lot of control over students. Students complete a lot of controlled uh, tasks. And um, fluency focused activities, they are known as freer practice. And this is when students have an opportunity to improvise, speak at length and uh, use the language they want to use in this particular activity. Clearly, it's not black and white. Of course, there are lots of activities which are somewhere in between, and uh, this is always a scale. This is not just two little boxes. No, this is always a scale. And of course, there are some semi-controlled practice uh, and there is some uh, uh, less free or more freer practice or free, freer activities. But thinking about activities which we give to our students, we should, uh, we should be constantly asking, what kind of view is this? Are we trying to control everything and hear a correct answer, or we try to give students opportunities to actually say what they want to say and focus a little bit more on authentic language. So this is important. There are a few more things I want to talk about. We've talked about one, uh, one aspect at a time out of many, and so we've talked about uh, controlled practice versus freer practice. Now the activity itself. Let's think about communicative activities. What would it make a community activity? Well, a community activity should be meaningful. So people who talk together, and we're talking about speaking today, if they're talking together, they should know why they're talking together. Okay, they should have some, some interest, some gap in, in knowledge. And of course, uh, community activity requires communication. Uh, you don't want your students to ask each other uh, what time it is, uh, if they know what time it is. But if you give them, for example, if you give them different uh, uh, little, little pieces of paper with, with timing given there uh, and ask them each other, uh, what time is it on your, on your clock? Uh, and then, if, uh, then, then students would be reacting, giving there the time they have. And of course, there will be some communication. Uh, usually, communicative activities, they involve negotiation and maybe some recasts. Uh, the, the easiest would be, could you repeat, please? What did you say? Is, is this what you're asking about? Is this what you said? I don't understand. Repeat. This is basic neg negotiation uh, uh, patterns, which are uh, samples of authentic speech, which are part of, uh, a part of uh, communicative activities. And of course, uh, of course, we'll be talking about um, uh, real time. So exchange usually takes place in real time. These days, if we have mobile phones, we, have, we can have delayed uh, communication, which is voice messaging. And, and that's fine, and that's great. But uh, usually, communicative activity comes with face-to-face -face or maybe online, but uh, communication which takes place in real time. Communicative activities are not predictable at all. We don't know what the student will ask about, or we might know what, what is the subject matter or what the topic is, but we don't know the wording or intonation or phrases. So this is unpredictable. There is a lot of improvisation in communicative activities. There are many types of communicative activities. I'll show you just a few, of course you know them. Which one is this about? What do you think? Take a minute, take a look. There are two two focal points here, two teaching points, at least. Yeah, this is a questionnaire. This is known as find someone who, and uh, the target language here would be places in town, revising vocabulary, or learning vocabulary or practicing vocabulary. So, of course, there's going to be about uh, places in town. You see lots of places. And also, it's about questions. What do you want in your town where you live? So the question probably would be yes, no question. Do you want a library in the town when you leave, uh, you, uh, where you live? Uh, do you want more clothes shops in Moscow? Do you want more pubs in St. Petersburg, for example? Yeah. So it's gonna be practice of questions, probably present simple, probably very standard cliches. Do you want or would you like, or what do you think about, depending how you sell it to your students. And of course, the skill, which is uh, practice here, this is, this is speaking. And now the activity type for you. You don't need to read all this, all this script, but you can clearly see what the task is. Roll card one, roll card two, roll card three, roll card four. Role play, yeah. 
yeah, it's about role play. And when a student is not himself, him or herself anymore, uh, they turn into somebody else and they take somebody else's um, language or habits or ideas, usually coming with from, from cards uh, given by the teacher. And then they try to communicate using information they have in their cards. This is another ex example of a communicative activity, extremely communicative and uh, very close to authentic language we have in our everyday lives. And this one, I like it as well. Low levels. What would be the teaching point here? What's the main, what's the main teaching point? Actually two, apart from speaking, which is a skill here. Yes, I think you've, you've guessed it right. Uh, this is about uh, uh, verbs, actions, which things which you can do in the park. In the park, and you can play play guitar. You can run around. You can uh, um, eat. What else is there? You can sit in a cafe. And it's also about present progressive or present continuous. Yeah, he is running. Uh, she is reading. They are chatting. Uh, he is playing the guitar. So. Uh, uh, two focal points. And of course, the, sub, the skill practice here is, is speaking. Different types of communicative activities for you. Take a look at this one. I took this from a new cutting edge, I think intermediate or maybe up intermediate. And this is also a, a great example of communicative activity. Clear aim for the learner, is it there? It is. Is it meaningful? Oh yeah. Requires communication, involves negotiation, timing, and unpredictable. What can you do here? What could be the teaching point? Actually, a few. Actually, a few. And uh, uh, from my experience, some teachers say, "Oh, this could be, uh, this could be directions," and the others, "That's right." Or this could be present progressive. That's fantastic. He's walking there. Or he. This could be uh, present perfect. He has turned around the corner. The, he. They have hidden there. But actually, this is what this is what the book says. Uh, the main fo focus here is on uh, conditionals. Yeah. Uh, if we, and then, and uh, different types of conditionals actually. And uh, this could be a second conditional or maybe maybe third conditional if you are talking about something in the past. Maybe first conditional. If you want to think about future, if we go there, he turns here. Yeah. Uh, and of course, the, the main task here, the main goal here is to uh, rob a museum and steal great the great diamond from this museum, which you can see here. Yeah, this is the great diamond. Yeah, yeah. So lots of opportunities for improvisation and uh, a very communicative activity, which can later on from speaking develop into a, a writing activity. But first of all, this is of course a speaking activity with focus on some grammar functions. Okay, let's take a look at a few more. We've just, uh, we've just discussed uh, the first one, which is um, find someone who, and then we've talked about role plays, and then we've talked about comparing two pictures. And these are two more, which you might find interesting. Believe it or not, uh, I would call this communicative activities as well with focus on speaking. The first one, have you ever or when, gives you a set of questions and it looks like a game. Well, these days you can play board games or you can play online games. For example, if you go to the website known as um, Wordwall and you can find lots of uh, cards and then uh, use it for online teaching, which, which uh, have these cards. They have uh, pretty much the same questions. Have you ever traveled by train? Have you ever kissed an animal? Have you ever slept outside under the stars? And of course, there will be a, a, a very quick answer. There's an opportunity. Yes, I have, or no, I haven't. And this is just the beginning. But then there could be a few more. No, I haven't. Oh, yes, I have. I slept, and then there will be da 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 da, -da in, past, in past simple. Hmm. But this is an activity to practice, have you ever, as a chunk of so present perfect with third form. And the, the, the second one would be uh, focus on uh, uh, general knowledge and uh, model verbs, might, uh, when, when you are exploring this possibility, what you might find in the desert or what, what you might find in the ocean. 
And of course, this could be a great reason for vocabulary, but it gives uh, learners a meaningful, mindful activity uh, to focus on might and verbs of uh, probability. Uh, there is might here in the task, but you can, of course, stretch it to can, could, you could probably move it into the past if you want to. What could you find in the desert? What could you find in the US? Or what would you find if you went? So you can even stretch it even further and um, turn this into a communicative activity with focus on uh, conditionals. And again, it's all with, uh, with, their, uh, it's with focus on speaking. Now, having said this much, a few more ideas for you. What we can do if we want to have the learner, we can be selective when we choose the language and the lesson aims. We want to focus on one thing at a time. That's the first postulate. And the second one would be, uh, we should probably give enough free practice activities. So make sure we use a lot of activities which stimulate authentic speaking. And for this, we should be probably using communicative tasks with a lot of scaffolding. Scaffolding is a, is a professional term, which means help. So we want to help our learners and this is what it looks like. Uh, we give our learners a question, have you ever? And then this is an example of scaffolding. You don't ask them to ask questions. You don't require them these questions. You give them the questions and then they answer them. Low level learners like it because they don't need to think about how to put everything in order. They just need to produce it. And the interlocutor just needs to uh, answer, yes, I have, no, I haven't. So there is lots of support in this type of activities. And of course, what you might find in the desert, uh, of course, there is a lot of scaffolding because students don't need to worry about ideas. They have a lot of stems here. They, they have lots of... Um, Phrases in a kitchen, another planet, in a uh, superhero's closet, which is uh, interesting. What uh, what you might find? What might you find in a superhero's closet? Ah, I don't know. Let's move on. Let's move on. We've just spoken about the uh, mechanics of speaking. We we've just said that there are quite a few sub skills. We've spoken about different aspects we need to consider, and there is one which I chose not to talk about because this, this could take good two hours to explore, because this would be, well, this one. This is pronunciation and it's phonology. Yeah, we, we can't focus on phonology, but you, can, you should probably focus on pronunciation um, once in a while, but not every time a student speaks. And of course, there is room for error correction and a little bit of this, a little bit of that. But if you want your students to develop, and if you want to develop their pronunciation, you should probably focus on pronunciation and um, spend a good 40 minutes, spend a lesson uh, to focus on a few things. What can you focus on when thinking about pronunciation? Of course, there would be this neutral sound, uh, uh, long face, relaxed uh, mouth, uh. It's schwa is the most frequent sound and vowel, at least uh, in the English language. Uh. And actually, you can see it everywhere. Photography. It's a photography. Photography. So is stress. It's o, but fo and graphy. It's schwa and schwa. About. It's also schwa, or it's just reduced sound. Submit. Schwa. Tiger. Teacher. Learner. Yeah, all these are at the very end of these. Um, uh, all these words, all these are schwa sounds. But apart from that, we need to think about individual phonemes. We need to think about pitch, how it changes from low to high to high to low. And then uh, vowels, whether short or long, if it's an o or o, and there's consonants, and this is stress, and this is a rhythm. And of course, there is intonation part. It's a, oh, this is a false. Maybe rise? Fall rise, they said. Okay. And, uh, Comparing with the Russian language, I believe intonation is very, uh, English intonation or American and British English or American intonation is, is quite difficult to acquire and quite different from what we have because the Russian language is usually flat uh, when, when, when you listen to it. So listen to an audio book in, um, or to block of news in the Russian language, it's gonna be flat. Yeah, with, with not this much deviation uh, or discrepancy between the high pitch and the low pitch. But uh, in the English language, it's going to be a roller coaster going up and down all the time. And you don't want to miss that, if I say. Okay. 
Uh, and we probably need to teach our learners how to, how to do this, how to imitate this intonation patterns. And you cannot do this when you're teaching them grammar, or when you're teaching them articulation. Intonation is a separate subskill. And it's also a part of the speaking activity as well. So it actually adds more to the list we had. Uh, apart from that, there would be weak forms and strong forms. Sometimes teachers forget about this, uh, but actually, uh, if you take this, this phrase in isolation, this would be, I would like some fish and chips. But no one says this like this. No one pronounced this phrase. And usually what, what uh, uh, speakers say, I would like some fish and chips. I would like some fish and chips. Maybe with strong and here. I would like some fish and chips. Still, it's, it's better, but it's still uh, still a, bit, a little bit disconnected. But in spoken language, it's going to be, I would like some fish and chips. I would like some fish and chips. And students need to be need to be able to recognize this first of all when they're listening to when they hear these phrases, listening to listen to um, uh, authentic speech. And of course, they should be able to produce this. We should teach them because if you bring it to an extreme, they would be I'd like some fish and chips, and that's it. Mm. Chips, fish and chips. I'd like some fish. Yeah, you see lots of schwas, lots of reduced sounds, lots of lots of elision, lots of uh, connection in between. And it's all about strong and weak sounds. Again, and this is a separate subscale, sub and this is a separate part of, of speaking. Yet another part of speaking. Now, enough, enough from me. Let's take a look at my students uh, and uh, some, more, some more examples. The first one I'll show you. Uh, you will uh, watch a short video clip, and it's going to be Lisa talking about talking about Donald Duck, actually. And this is one of the activities we did, I believe, in July. Take a look at the picture. There's going to be a sample of storytelling from Lisa. Okay. While listening to 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 Lisa's speech. Try to, and it's going to be video. Uh, try to identify some patterns which she has learned. This is not your first take, actually. This is the last one. What has she learned? Try to identify this. Why do you think uh, this sample, this video sample, not a perfect one, but a good one, is so productive for Lisa? Okay, so uh, uh, I'll just switch on my video. Here it comes. Hypnotism fat, sat. Here it comes. Here we go. You can start talking now. Go ahead. Uh, the Donald Duck bought a hypnotism set, and he um, and he wanted to try out on Pluto. He uh, he said, "Pluto, now you're a mouse," and Pluto seen a uh, thought. Uh, that he was the was mouse. Uh, after that, uh, Donald turns turns uh, turns out uh, Pluto in chicken, and and uh, turns uh, and turned out uh, Pluto in mine. Uh, Pluto, the, uh, Pluto thought uh, that he was a lion and, uh, and went after the Donald. Duck uh, uh, cl uh, climbed up the wall on the roof and fall uh, and fall on and fell on fell on Pluto. The fall brought Pluto to senses. But what happened with Donald? A Donald uh, don't understood, uh, didn't understand, uh, didn't understand um, what Pluto brought to senses. Yeah, didn't understand what happened and and uh, go away and ran away. Okay, ran away. Thank you. Okay. 
Okay. Uh, I, 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 I believe I can actually see and I, I can actually feel this thinking process uh, Liz is going through again and again and again and again. But I will show you the task one more time. Now, uh, what did you notice in this video and in terms of Liz's performance? Did you notice the vocabulary from, uh, from the story? Hmm. Hmm. So we, we worked on that. Did you notice the procedure? The, not just procedure, the, uh, the logics, the, uh, the answer uh, she, was giving, she was giving and the, the story she was telling from the very beginning to the very end. Of course, there were quite a few new words for Lisa, including set and hypnotism. And uh, uh, did you notice, by the way, Lisa corrects herself? And he uh, don't understood and he didn't understand. He go away, he went away. And Lisa is a little bit slow and that's great because uh, this is a very good sign when uh, a child, especially a child, maybe not a uh, adult learner because adults, they, they control uh, themselves a bit better. But when a child starts rocking, it means he or she is thinking or impatient or wants to go further. And with Lisa, you can see, yes, she wants to go further. She's shaking, she's, she's trying to produce this language using the language she has on the screen and on this uh, uh, little cartoon. Okay, so this is an example, and this is the outcome of uh, the storytelling technique. And clearly, you can build up your whole lesson on storytelling and uh, bring more. This this is not a very communicative activity because I knew the story, Lisa read the story. And it's, I understand, I mean that. But I think this is a very productive activity, especially if you do it a few times in a row, uh, adding more and more information, just turning this into a snowball. By the way, did you notice how I was uh, helping Lisa? I was scaffolding her. Just questions. And what happened next? And next? Oh, and then he ran away. Mm -hmm. And what happened to Donald mm. and Pluto? Okay. So I was listening attentively and then asking questions, uh, not giving the answers. And Liz was giving the answers actually. And the performance was pr pretty, pretty, pretty good for, for this level, as, as I can see for, for Lisa. Okay. Uh, now let's let's take a look at a few more things. And I want you to think about last time you used your mobile phone in your teaching. When was it? For me, this was two days ago, I think, in your teaching. When was the last time you used your mobile phone teaching? You, you can do quite a few things with mobile phones these days because you have this voice recorders and voice messages in all mobile phones. But uh, let's take a look at uh, what, uh, what I did with a couple of years ago with another student, and her name is Marsha. Take a look at the task. Do you remember this? Do you remember how many aspects you need to keep in mind when preparing a talk? Structure, conceptualization, language choice, vocabulary, grammar, syntax, formal, informal, general, specific, neutral, mm, message, timing, 90 seconds. And uh, this is the task, and this is Marsha speaking. Listen, what do you think? It's exactly 90 seconds. Uh, my friend, uh, Stacy is 14 years old. Her, um, I admire her because she's very beautiful, careful, and wise. We studied seven years in one class. She's a uh, Really, Germany and um, positive person. <clears throat> she has sister and brother, and she loves them very much. You can talk with her about everything, and she listens to you. I can phone to her, and she and answer any time. She's funny and we can laugh with her with her. For me, she's just my best friend. Um Stacy is very serious and I have much to learn from her. And I cherish our friendship 
and I hope that we will continue our friendship. It's all important in our life now. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what do you think? I believe that Masha spent a lot of time thinking about this little presentation. And this was clearly her home task. And uh, could, you, could you recognize some words and patterns which she took actually from the lesson we, we had before? Yeah, this was at school. So this, this, she was a school student, my school student, a couple of years ago. And she was 13 at that time, I think. Mm -hmm. not, not a particularly strong student for, this, for that group, but she was trying to work hard, at least at home. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, cherish. And uh, uh, she used a few phrases which, uh, which I gave her, I gave her the, the class uh, the, the day before. And uh, you can hear that she's thinking, she's a bit slow, but she's not reading actually. She has a few, uh, th this was my plan originally to build up this plan in the classroom and to make sure that they record a message at home. And she, she had this plan and she was following the plan without reading all these uh, words or phrases, but uh, paying attention only to patterns she needed to focus on. And uh, I think this was, uh, for that period of time, a very successful, for Masha, very successful outcome. And when, when, she, was, when she was done, she said, okay, that's all. Meaning she was tired and she was maybe not very happy, but still there would be a, a check in the chat box. Okay, uh, the same task. A different student. His name is Kirill. Uh, 90 seconds, by the way. I would like to talk about a man I admire. Uh, it's my friend Sasha from a summer camp. Um, he was our guide in that camp. Um, I admire him uh, because he is very laid back and cheerful. Studied at university and is 22. When he came, I immediately understood that my holiday will be awesome. He always helped us and he was so funny. Uh, that was tour camp uh, with different camping trips and rafting. There were some moments when he showed that he is extremely brave. He saved the girl from a little fall waterfall. He wanted to become medic. He played with us for all time that we were there. I really want to see him again. I know that he cooks really tasty and nourishing. This summer I'd like to come back to this camp and see him again. Yeah, I, I don't know why Kirill chose to talk about uh, uh, cooking habits his friends has. Uh, well, I really want to see him again, but now he cooks really well. Yeah, and then uh, he mispronounced this word nourishing. That's what he was trying to say, the food is nourishing. But again, again, a lot of effort. And clearly, this was not the first take Kirill, uh, Kirill made. I think he practiced or had a few takes before he send this. Uh, I'm reading your questions in the, in the chat. So you're adding your questions um, to, to the videos, streaming videos. And um, uh, Grapefruit Orange, uh, this is a question from Grapefruit, somebody called uh, Grapefruit Orange. And uh, this person uh, writes, I know that most students are reluctant to record themselves. Uh, they feel self-conscious. How can a teacher make this self-recording task less awkward for students? Uh, this is a good question. I think this is a, um, a question of agreement. If you set up the rules, for example, you're not planning to send these videos or audios to somebody else unless you get the permission from your students uh, or, you, you will, or, or students will just record it and then keep it on the mobile phones. Mm. Uh, so students might, might be reluctant, might, might feel a bit self-conscious uh, with this task, but if you explain why you want this, and if you maybe turn this into a game, or into a product, or into a uh, collaborative activity, 
chances are high that uh, they will do this. Again, uh, I think you should talk to your students if, if, you, if there is a question of, uh, uh, of this uh, in your classroom or in, in your environment and uh, try to find out why, may, maybe in Russian, why the student is not willing to, to put his or her voice uh, on this voice recorder. And there, there are a few reasons. First of all, the children are shy. They don't want to feel embarrassed. And it's, I can understand that, but then say, okay, that's how we develop. I want you to just record a little message. Let's do this. Good, good. Uh, th this, there is a, um, mm, a different perspective. You can explain a student, but this, this messaging or this, these recordings could be actually uh, examples of uh, the student's success. And, uh, and everyone wants to be successful, more or less. Uh, or everyone wants to have something done appropriately or successfully. So this could be successful. Probably students have very high expectations, or maybe they have very high standards, or maybe their parents have high standards, or maybe they want to think they, they should sound authentic. But okay, then you need to load down the pressure, say, we are not, uh, I don't want you to sound authentic. I just want you to make sure that you have this message. And what actually uh, I uh, have done a few times. I've, I've recorded a few podcasts with my students, and this is one of them. So I teach with podcasts, and this is uh, just a little sample from, I think this is Roma's uh, podcast. Yeah, that's what it sounds like. And this is the product, the final product. Uh, the podcast lasts about 15 minutes. Uh, <laughs> relax, it's going to be only two minutes for you, maximum. Hello everyone, and this is Blakin Raman with you, and I'm going to tell you about sunglasses. Sunglasses, or shades, are a form of protective eyewear designed primarily to prevent bright sunlight and high energy visible light from damaging or discomforting the eyes. For historic and historic time, Muhyid people were flattened for slippery glasses, looking through narrow slits to block armor reflected rays of the sun. It is said that the Roman Emperor Nero liked to watch gladiator fight with emeralds. These, however, appeared to have worked rather like mirrors. Sunglasses made from flat panes of smoky quartz, which offered no corrective powers, could deep protect the eyes from glare were used in China in the 12th century or possibly earlier. Ancient documents describe the use of such crystal sunglasses by judges in ancient Chinese courts to conceal their facial expressions while questioning witnesses. We'll stop here. This was a part of Roma's podcast on sunglasses. And you might have heard about BBC Radio 4 project known as A History of the World in 100 Objects and what they do there. They take uh, uh, 100 objects, like literally 100 objects from the British Museum and they explore them. And they talk to specialists, to professionals and there are interviews and there is some uh, narration and uh, uh, some storytelling involved and music in the background. So uh, this was uh, this inspired me to run and record a few podcasts with, their, with my students. And this is one of the samples, and this is a pretty average sample for, for my students. I've heard, I've had fantastic uh, from different perspectives and sound production, both sound production and language, but this was an average. And what could you notice in Roma speech? Background music. And uh, this was the point, actually. What else? Uh, there could be there was some narrative when Roma was actually reading something, which was not supported by me in the classroom. But uh, well, he did what he wanted. Uh, later on, there would be a few. Uh, there will be a few interviews, and uh, a few uh, longer interviews, and one quick interview when everyone had to interview their classmates. And I've had quite a few topics. Uh, I've had we've had. In different classrooms, different age groups, different schools, even uh, bicycles. Uh, uh, what else? Lighter, uh, airplane, mobile phone, uh, 
I think we've had uh, football or baseball, can't remember now, but I think football and uh, a few more, a few more, uh, quite a lot of things. Oh yes, uh, cars uh, and uh, every student who submitted this podcast to me into an MP3 file later on, uh, they, they, they uh, produce about 10 to 15 minutes of uh, a podcast. Half of this, at least, I think more usually was their speech and the rest interviews plus music. So uh, we're not talking about podcasts in detail because you could uh, break it into smaller parts and uh, run a, a separate session on this. But if you are trying to work with sound and voice recording and maybe podcasting like this, take a look at Audacity or maybe GarageBand if you're using MacBooks, but Audacity is uh, software which helps you to, uh, to play different types of uh, tracks and to actually combine different tracks. Uh, uh, clearly, you need to teach your learners how to use it, or you can use your mobile apps, which is, uh, from some perspective, easier, but from a different perspective, that this might be a bit more challenging for learners. Anyway, this was a sample of podcasting, and this is one of the ideas how you can develop actually speaking on top of reading and other, other skills. So teaching with projects. And a podcast is a sample or an example of a project. You focus on the product and then you can show it to somebody else. You focus on learning autonomy and you develop it and you stimulate learning autonomy because all students could choose their own topics. And of course, they were, they were guided through the process, but there was a lot of collaboration and there was a lot of independent work in this. Timing is usually flexible, so uh, there, are, there are some deadlines, but I say, okay, if you need another week, go for it. And students and teachers can concentrate on formal meaning as needed. So I can listen and say, okay, there's great information. I loved your talk about sunglasses, Rama, but now let's think about words you said, minute two. You said something, what was wrong? Mm, mm. Okay, next time try to, so I can give immediate feedback or we can give delayed feedback and have some samples of student talk. Later on, this could be uh, a good sample for the learner to actually monitor, see and recognize progress they make after half a year or year of, uh, uh, of lessons. And finally, you can, of course, run these projects in collaboration, uh, which means you, this could be teamwork, two speakers or four speakers, or you can uh, stimulate collaboration, asking students to, to listen to each other's voices. Now, what makes a speaking lesson? Uh, this is a big question because speaking per se is, we, we don't worry about speaking per se as much. Usually we want to add something in. We want to throw in some grammar, vocabulary, functions, uh, sub sub skills. And of course we want to focus on one thing at a time and make it communicative. Can you remember? Yes. Okay, I will show you a little um, uh, sample of a lesson from China, actually, and this is Nick Lidwell uh, talking about, not just talking, giving a, a lesson in China. What do you think? Take a look. Level is B2, and there are about 40 students in the classroom, I think maybe, maybe even more, 40. Yes, you will see it. But the level is B2, main focus is speaking, but you will see a few more activities, not just speaking. Take a look. Here it comes. Okay, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Okay, how are you? Not sleepy? Mon Monday morning. On Monday, I'm sleepy, yeah? I think everybody is sleepy on Monday, yeah? After your mind is the, on the weekend, not on English class. <laughs> Normal. Okay, don't worry. Um, do you have the letter, application letter? If you have it, can you take it? Good, good. Well done, well done. Good, good. Okay, keep the letter for five minutes. Um, we'll, because today we're going to do a, uh, an interview in the job. You're going to interview somebody for the job. But wait a minute. Okay, do you remember uh, Mr. Lee? Do you remember? Uh, what job did he apply for? Yeah, uh, say, Sean? Uh, Ubisoft uh, Game Programmer. Good, Ubisoft Game 
program. Okay, he had experience. With your partner, can you just remember what was his experience? What is his qualifications? What are his good points? Was he confident? And did he speak good English? Okay, just speaking two, uh, three, two, two or three or two, just remember speaking. Okay, do you remember? Um, what was his qualification, Carrie? Good. Okay, his English level? Bad or good? Good. Okay. Was he confident? Do you know, do you know what I mean by confident? Yeah, am, am I confident? Oh, confident. Okay, good. Okay, now, we're going to listen again, and I've got some more detailed question. Um, Mikey, can you give these out down here? And uh, Zimping, can you give out one each? And, sorry, Tom, can you give out one each? Okay, any idea what is number one? What particular quality do you think that you... Sorry, okay, Maggie, is it Maggie? Maybe have, maybe. Okay, don't write. Okay, I want you to listen to the interview, and when you hear the word, write. Um, I think, I think one space, one word. Yeah? So number one is one word, one word. Tell, du, du, du. Okay, let's try. Okay, let's go. Ah, good morning. Uh, it's Mr. Lee, isn't it? Yes. Uh, please come in, take a seat. Thank you. Now, uh, Mr. Lee, yes. um, I see from your letter that you'd like to join our team of game producers here at Ubisoft in Shanghai. Is that yes, right? yes, that's right. You know, I've always been dreaming of to join a team of talents like Ubisoft. Good. So what particular qualities do you think that you have that you can contribute to our company? Did you get it? <laughs> Let's just check it again. You'd like... Okay, just compare a bit. Have you got the same answers? <laughs> Not bad. This is a problem, isn't it? Nobody has this one, number, number seven, huh? Nobody has number seven now. Yeah. Maybe that, that's, that's the problem, huh? Yeah? yeah, yeah, this is good. Yeah. Good. Good. Okay, number seven is difficult for everybody. Okay, yeah, is it, I can't see, sorry, uh, Sean again. Sean, number one. What particular qualities do you think that you have that you can contribute to our company good so the words i have and contribute uh did you get that right can somebody spell for me contribute angela good good contribute means to that yeah, means like to give yeah contribute okay um what about number two iris iris you got that number two Max? tell me about your qualifications excellent okay Tell me about your qualifications. Okay, listen to my intonation. Tell me about your qualifications together. Good, good. Okay, number three, maybe Laura? Can you tell me which companies you have worked for? Okay, excellent. You have worked for, okay? You have worked for. When we speak English quickly, you have, we say you've. So you've worked for. Um, which companies you've worked for? Which companies you've worked for? Together. Together. Can you tell me which companies you work for? Excellent.
Excellent. Good, good. Uh, Shelley, can you? Uh, just repeat, can you? Um, can I tell you which company is for? Excellent. Good, good. Okay. Yeah, we'll stop here. This is just the beginning of a bigger speaking lesson and in a, in a big classroom, a large classroom, 40 plus students in China. Uh, what did you notice? Interesting, isn't it? Well, what I've noticed were quite a few very interesting steps. First, there was a little communication and warm up, so sleepy on Monday morning. Okay, yes. Then there was a quick revision activity. What can you remember about Mr. Lee? And actually, Nick was collecting uh, answers from students. So it was a revision and putting it on board and say, okay, talk together about his situation. He's applying for a job. And uh, what happened next? Uh, students talk together, of course. And then uh, he collected, uh, it was open class feedback. He collected a few samples from some students and say, okay, I will play a recording later. Uh, this is a gap fill exercise we need to focus on. And this is actually an interview, a job interview. So you will hear a job interview. Uh, students were focusing on uh, gaps and filling the gaps. And he played a little bit of recording. Students, uh, it was a demonstration, students, uh, uh, gave him the answer, he kept on, then he monitored, students compared in pairs, and there was a lot of speaking involved again, and then say, okay, this was correct, incorrect, da, 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 da. and this is just first six minutes of a lesson, these many stages. The main stage, uh, speaking for uh, free, uh, free practice, speaking for fluency, will happen later, and this would be a job interview. So by this time, students they, they remember Mr. Lee and his situation, so, and remember vocabulary from the previous lesson. Uh, and everyone knows that it's there because it's on the board and actually they've gone through this. There are a few more simple phrases from the scripts they received, and they actually focused on a few phrases which were in, on the tape in, the, in this listening activity. So the main, uh, uh, main uh, focus of this listening activity was not just developing listening skills, but uh, focusing on uh, the target language, functional language. And later on, students would be sitting together, uh, talking to each other, interviewing each other using vocabulary from the previous lesson, from this script, which they now have, and developing their, their speaking skills, and then answering these questions. So uh, this was a lead-in, a warmer for, for a speaking lesson. Just six minutes and how, this is how much you can do in a speaking lesson. Let's move on, let's move on. A few more things uh, I want you to focus on and we still have about half an hour before we finish. Now, uh, take a look. If you think about a, a typical list, uh, speaking lesson, you will probably have a lead-in and context. You can, you can start with lead-in, a little warmer than context, what is happening. Then work with target language and in um, uh, Nick's lesson, this, was, this came from the listening activity. And then clear model and demonstration was there. And then there was a key communicative task. Uh, the model of demonstration can come from a teacher or two strong students or a teacher and the students. But then the communicative, communicative task should come up when students can actually practice this target language or sub-skill they, they should be working on uh, this time. And the final stage, this will be feedback, feedback and reflection. What have we learned today? Maybe a little bit of error correction. Uh, maybe let's think about our progress today. This could make a very good 40 minute lesson. Let's take a look at what we have in, uh, in books. Oh, before we do this, if you're interested in model lessons, you, go to my, you can go to my website. There will be a link to nine model lessons on speaking, listening, grammar, reading, writing, vocabulary. Uh, we filmed this at Nova Escola in Moscow couple of years ago and um, the idea was to have the simple model lessons which you can then analyze and there, there are actually a few lesson plans to these lessons. So uh, you can watch and maybe learn or communicate through this or maybe explore your techniques, your style of teaching. This is how I teach and these are real students, uh, different age groups actually starting from 12 and up to 17 I think at some point. Now uh, a typical lesson from a course book and the course book today would be optimized. Uh, this is the speaking page, this is what we have in, um, in the course book. And this is what it looks like. First, watch the video, then watch the video again. Uh, phrase expert, focus on vocabulary. In pairs and groups, brainstorm words and phrases. 
as many as possible related to the photo, then complete the sentences, D, 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 describe the photo. This, this should, uh, should take good 40 minutes. Uh, what are my um, hesitations about this particular lesson? I, 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 like the, I like the material because what we have here, we have a very clear demonstration, it's a video. And then we watch the video again, focus on the target language. And then there is some planning. You remember students need time for planning and need some structures. This is about conceptualizing and vocabulary choice, grammar choice as well, so it's there. But actually do have a lot of time left on, uh, on number five, which is the target speaking activity. No, describe this photo, how long would it take? Three minutes, four minutes, talk on your own for about a minute. Do you call this a speaking lesson when you have only one activity, number five, with focus on speaking? There, there, are, there are bits of speaking in between when students compare their, uh, what they've understood and so they check their answers and they ask questions maybe, but actually there is only one little speaking activity when literally students need to talk on your own for about a minute. This does make a good speaking lesson. Unfortunately, with all these parts, which I like, demonstration and um, vocabulary input and uh, thinking, conceptualizing and gap fill activity with focus on another part of target language, which is grammar here, then production takes only one minute. This should be changed. If you think about uh, lesson stages and timing, you should probably spend three minutes on lead in and a few more minutes on context setting then work with target language. Altogether, this should give you maybe 17 minutes. With Nick in China, this was, I think, about 12 minutes because some of the video was, uh, was erased. Uh, they didn't want to show you everything. But again, this should be 15, maybe 17 minutes. Then clear model demonstration somewhere, maybe one or two minutes, and then communicative, communicative task. Let students speak for 15 minutes and make sure everyone speaks 15 minutes or everyone speaks in pairs. So this would make maybe seven, eight minutes per person. And this what makes an actually speaking lesson with their quick feedback at the very end, maybe error correction stage, maybe reflection, reflection stage if you want it. I'll show you a few more uh, resources, a few more sources where you can take some model lessons. And this is one of them. I like elo.org because there are no native speakers talking on different um, uh, subjects, actually, on different topics. And um, you can probably show it in your classroom and say, OK, hey, 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 this is what people from Ghana or Switzerland are doing. Can you do the same? Film yourself. Let's take a look. I think I have a few, thing, a few short videos to show. Yeah, here it comes. And this one is from uh, Giselle, I think. Let's see. Hello, my name is Gisela. And the question I will be answering is, do you have a job now? Well, the answer will be yes and no. No, in the strict sense that uh, I don't have a job uh, being an employee of someone in a company and receiving a salary. But yes, I do have a job in the sense that I've been a freelancer for more than 15 years now. And it's a very gratifying experience. It's something I can do at home. I do what I like to do, okay? And every time I get hired to do what I do, which is translating English to Spanish and vice versa, and also voiceover projects, well, I get paid for them. And that is a job with its own responsibilities. So I really think it's great and I won't change it for an eight hour job. Uh, what do you think about that? This is a nice demonstration uh, from, from Hisela. But actually, I have another one. And this one is from, from Russia. And I think from, from Medina. This is what Medina says. And this is just 45 seconds. Take a look. Hello, this is Medina from Russia. The question is about how often I check my email. Well... I check my email on average once an hour. I'm an English tutor and a translator. So I need to check um, very often if a lesson has been canceled or something has happened. 
or if there is anything in you on the agenda for me to translate. I want to be a good professional, so I need to keep touch with my customers and I need to regularly check my email, but it's no problem. Okay, okay, okay. So this was just a demonstration of what you can, how can you use lo.org, uh, triple L. And um, I think Ludmila Vasilina asked me a couple of minutes ago about uh, whether I use uh, audios or videos uh, while teaching speaking. Actually, both. If I want to have a demonstration, which is a video, I show a video. If I want, uh, if I need uh, an audio, like such a podcast, I, of course, use a podcast. Okay, okay. Uh, before I show you a few more videos from my classroom, uh, this is a, uh, a big idea for you, a motto, I would say. What well, all you need to do, basically, um, believe it or not, is to uh, persuade your learner to keep talking. And uh, this, uh, this, is, this would be the, the biggest challenge, but also this would give you a lot of, uh, give the learner a lot of opportunity to develop uh, his or her speaking skills. Now, uh, there are a few potential uh, pitfalls or uh, methodology problems. Let's take a look at these potential problems. Uh, first, this is what I've seen in, in a few lessons. Uh, students, uh, not students, but teachers, can uh, quite frequently give instructions, just talk. This doesn't make much sense to me. Which skill do I want to develop? Or which skill I want to, sub-skill I want to develop uh, with this task? And students don't understand this either. Teacher, why should we talk? What's the reason for, for, the, for the speaking activity? What are we doing? Just talk is not an activity. Another one would be discuss with your partner. I love this one, and I, I, I say these words again, 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 but if you, you need to discuss with your partner if there is some uh, information gap, if there is gap in knowledge. For example, we have just individually finished working on certain uh, tasks, and I have my answers, and this student has his or her answers. And now I want to check whether my answers are correct or whether we have the same answers or not, uh, the same results. And then we can check and discuss. But uh, read a text and discuss with your friends doesn't sound very logical to me. Why? What? And what is the result? What's the outcome? Make a presentation. I think this is the killer for many reasons, because presentation is an extremely complex procedure. Uh, and not talking about slides. I'm talking about your uh, posture, body language, your position, your message, your sub-skills, uh, your... Uh, your habits, your uh, word choice, vocab uh, vocabulary choice, grammar choice, it's all there. And there is one more. Not all students like talking in front of the class. So why should you be giving this task? Okay, now stand up and make a presentation. Presentation is a very challenging task. So if you want to make a presentation, make sure you teach your learners how to, how to give a talk. And then you need to focus on vocabulary, which could be like numbers, five out of 10 or three out of four or 10 pupils out of or half of our class or 50% such and such. And make sure they know how to start and finish. Hello, my name is such and such or thanks so much for having me here. Should you have any questions, send me an email. Okay, or if you have any questions, I'll be happy to, uh, uh, to answer them immediately or at the very end of the talk. Uh, so uh, students normally, if you're talking about school kids, don't know these phrases, they might expect something, but you need to teach them first before you ask them to give a presentation. And of course, make a dialogue. Uh, this is, a, I think, an old school activity when uh, you ask students, okay, produce a dialogue. This is not authentic. This is usually not very communicative. Uh, and this is, um, uh, this is not life related anymore. Why should we be giving this task? Please don't, all right? So, uh, you need to make speaking tasks meaningful. You can do it in many ways. You can cheat a little bit and you can give meaningful tasks. A meaningful activity would be uh, a, a role play maybe, or different cards with different pictures, or find someone who activity, questionnaires, uh, different types of speaking activities could be communicative and meaningful. Sometimes you can actually talk your students into something else. That's an example. Oh no, before I tell, I'll give you the task. 
uh, the task looks like this. This is the task actually students are completing, but in a very specific manner. And later I'll tell you what they're doing, what, what they're doing and why. Take a look at the task first. I call this imaginary teachers at work. Yeah, take a look. This is my group, adult learners, uh, maybe five or six years ago. I think five. Yeah, yeah. So as you see, students are sitting in front of the wall and just talking to the wall using their notes and there is a clear task on the whiteboard which is the wall. Uh, now, uh, what could be my teaching point at this stage? Well, I believe that if you want to uh, become fluent, you need to make sure you can speak at length, uh, maybe without any interlocutor. And uh, in a real life situation, in authentic speaking, we usually have uh, an interlocutor, uh, the person we communicate with, and usually he or she nods or helps a little bit or smiles and reacts somehow, which makes our lives easier, which is great. But if you want to produce more language, if you want to produce more speaking, could be your first language as well, you should probably learn how to speak at length to your imaginary friends. This task could be helpful uh, for your gap preparation. And if you want to start speaking at length, because if you can't speak at length, your brain shut down, shuts down after maybe 10, 15 minutes because of this emotional cognitive overload, but actually you need to stimulate your brain. And these little helpers, such as questions from your friends or maybe uh, questions from your, from your listener, from the audience, don't help anymore. You need to keep going, keep going, keep going. If you want to run a marathon, you need to keep running. Actually, this this is the same. The same is true for uh, for speaking. So uh, I said, okay, draw an imaginary, draw a face on the whiteboard, and uh, imagine this your teacher. Give him or her name. Okay, write down the name. Fantastic. You like a teacher? Great. Now this is the task on the board. Talk to your teacher. And uh, well, this time I was filming, but uh, just a couple of minutes. Uh, but usually I walk around, I monitor, I take down uh, some uh, pitfalls and then I go through error correction stage. Students all ages usually enjoy the task. They find it challenging, provocative, interesting and developmental. Not all of them likes this, the, uh, the task because it looks bizarre, but uh, some of them do actually. Uh, I first tried it, I think maybe 15 or 17 years ago at some private school and it worked okay. And uh, I use it every now and then from time to time. A few more ideas for your, for your teaching lessons, for, for your speaking lessons. Actually, when we say speaking, it's not all about tasks. There are more speaking opportunities for, uh, for, for your learners in the classroom. Uh, you can do a couple of things. First of all, the activity itself. But if you go beyond that, it could be a small talk, the very beginning of the lesson with the teacher or with, uh, with the stu students together. They could be leading conversations. You've seen one from uh, Nick today and uh, clearly you know what this is because uh, if you're asking a few questions, learners react and this is speech acts and uh, this is also speaking. Uh, some students can repeat teacher's questions. For example, if you have stronger students and weaker students in the group, you can ask stronger students to repeat my questions for the rest of the group. So the learners, the low level learners would understand as well. And repeating teacher's instructions, the same thing. Pair work, uh, after students have completed a task individually, let them check in pairs in English. Let them, uh, let them talk and not just uh, swap their exercise books. Let them um, talk about the answers or about the experiences. How was it for you? Was it okay? Well, what, which part was problematic? And if they talk about this, this is again, uh, very communicative and it's focus on speaking here. Uh, they can work in groups, of course, and they, if they ask for help, and this is the first thing we probably teach, 
uh, when we teach our learners how they can say, I don't understand, can I go out? Uh, I don't know, I need help, or please help. Uh, asking for help, this is also speaking practice for low level learners or maybe for younger learners. Giving the answer, when students give the answer, not, this, not the teacher gives the answer, uh, asking questions, making comments, reflection, summing up the lesson. What we what have we done today? And then learners start talking, giving you, oh, we've talked about, we've focused on that, we've developed on this or that. And if you ask them, was it a good lesson? They can say yes, because, or they can say not really, because. A few sources for you. First of all, take a look at how to teach speaking by Scott Thunberry. You will find a lot of ideas and uh, there will be this explanation about four big stages of speaking um, of speaking activity. Uh, and also, uh, I like this, uh, this book, it's called Edipedia, comes from ET, uh, uh, ET Professional, which is English Teaching Professional. And um, there are a few books, one of them is on speaking, but also you can find this one, this volume, 1000 Ideas for English Language Teachers. A lot of ideas, very, very nice, a lot of bullet points. Uh, not not much theory, but mostly uh, mostly some ideas for your lessons. Uh, on top of that, you can uh, take a look at Adrian Underhill Sound Foundations if you if you're really into phonetics and pronunciation. If you want to teach pronunciation, this would be an important book just to look through and uh, see how how it's all organized and what you can do in what situation. And uh, a few more. Uh, links, which is Ello and Wordworld. If you haven't tried Wordworld, take a look. And uh, I just showed you Ello.org, um, which is uh, a website with a lot of samples from real life students. Okay, uh, if you're interested in comic books, you can find uh, comic books uh, uh, online. And uh, some people have been asking me about the, 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 the comic books I've, I've I've been uh, showing in, in this speaking seminar. So you will find one uh, on my website. Uh, this is Elephant Academy. We run this academy together with uh, Natasha Bilausova and we have uh, uh, online training for teachers from all over Russia. And uh, we still have a few more days left before the end of this big block. And you can jump in if you want to. Check it out, elephant.tips and uh, tell, uh, the, the secret link. It's not on the website, but I'm giving it to you, elephanttips slash share. You will find a few comic books there if you want to, PDF files. You will find more online if you're interested. And uh, finally, if you are interested in uh, teaching with technology, take a look at your guest speaking prep app. It's a free app, uh, 17 sets, a timer, your voice recording option. Your learners can actually record their voices and send it to you via WhatsApp or Facebook Messenger. Uh, Telegram as well, I think, uh, both Android and iOS, free of charge, absolutely free. You can find it. It's called Ye Gejim. Uh, you can find a link on my personal website, which is bakken.space. Uh, uh, there is a little glitch in this, uh, in this app with one of the tasks, but the rest work well, and I use it uh, when coaching students uh, to uh, Ye Ge speaking, if I need this. I guess Let's take a look at what we've done today. First of all, we've, taken, we, we've, we've looked at speaking as a skill and we've explored uh, speaking uh, as, sub, as a skill with different subskills and different dimensions of speaking. Uh, we talked about some problems learners might have and about some uh, techniques which can actually help the learner. And we talked about how we can help the learner. And we've talked about lesson stages and timing. And uh, of course, there were a few potential pitfalls. And uh, now I'll show you a little uh, demonstration from one classroom. I just found it a few days ago when I was getting ready for this session. Uh, and this is um, students introducing their school. And the, the, uh, the reason why they're introducing their class and their school is because we had this international project. I have a friend in Norway who at that time she was a teacher as well. So she said, okay, we decided to run a project together and say, why, uh, why not meet in Skype and let our students from Russia and from Norway to talk together and to meet each other on Skype. And we did that. But before we did that, we wanted our learners to introduce themselves and to 
uh, to introduce uh, their, their schools. And this was a little project. This is what it looks like, just a couple of minutes. Stop here, as you can see, uh, everyone is very excited because they know uh, we're planning to send it to Norway to to Norwegian pupils. We received one back, and we actually had this Skype conversation at some point. Uh, some of the students are um, reading from the whiteboard behind me. Actually, uh, a few a few notes, and you see that uh, uh, every every pupil has. Uh, his or her own uh, zone of responsibility, actually. So they're responsible for different different parts. Uh, and uh, I think altogether it went OK. And uh, I have two video because I was teaching two classes at that time at that school. So this is one class and they have another video with their other group, the other group of students. And uh, just to let you know, these kids, they are 11 and 12. Uh, they came with di different levels and you could hear this. Uh, and of course, different um, attitude and different uh, uh, vocabulary choices, but uh, it is a communicative task. It is a communicative activity. Uh, and they invested quite a few uh, minutes, or not minutes, I think, I'm not sure about hours, but they invested some time into this at some point. Let's wrap up. My bottom line for today will be, first of all, speaking is an extremely complex process. It includes decisions about content, grammar, vocabulary, pragmatics, articulation, syntax, uh, register, many other things. So be sensitive, take one aspect at a time. Be kind to your learners. Processing information takes time, which means you need to slow down and give students enough time to prepare, maybe focusing on each particular aspect. And finally, Students need meaningful tasks, so make sure that you give communicative and personalized activities. One more time, my name is Jenny Bakken, and uh, you will find more information about my training sessions at elephant.tips. And uh, now I will go and answer a few questions, because I think I've got some in the chat box. If you still have a few questions, you can post them next to the video you're watching now. And this is uh, question four from Natalia Dinsova. What books on methodology of teaching speaking can you recommend? And what are your favorite textbooks you have good exercise on speaking? Uh, I, I will not, well, the books on methodology I've just covered, which would be how to teach speaking, starting from that. There were lots of articles in ETP, in ET profe ETP professional, English teaching professional. Uh, you can find it online probably. And uh, the, the other book, which you, you have seen today, this would be a good start. Uh, there are a few sections on speaking in uh, uh, Jeremy Hammer's The Practice of Language Teaching and uh, uh, Learning Teaching from Jim Scrivener and uh, uh, Language Teaching Course by Penny Err. So these are big volumes, three Bibles we have at the moment on language teaching. Uh, but take a look, start with Scott Thunberry, How to Teach Speaking. Uh, Concerning your my favorite textbooks, I don't think I have any. So uh, every time I have a textbook, every time I have a group, I choose a textbook for this particular group or students. And I, I, I don't have this many choices. If this is 
at a public school, I just take what we have, spotlight, starlight, whatever. If it's a private school, then I take what they have in the private school or we make decisions together with other teachers. If it's a private class or a private lesson, I talk to my learner and say, okay, what do you want? And if this is an adult learner with focus, with interest in uh, um, speaking skills development, I might go to uh, like business meetings or something if, if there is some uh, business uh, requests. Uh, I, I would, I, I can't recall any particular book and I wouldn't recommend any particular before I know the learner. Question five from Maria. Do you usually create your own speaking activities and tasks or do you use the ones in the course book using with your students? I, I, I don't want to, to spend too much time on um, uh, material design. Uh, which means I take what we have in the course book. Sometimes I take something very, very simple from, uh, from my stashes, uh, which could be play a video and explore the video in a particular way. So uh, I would say I take what I have uh, in the course book or from the internet, but I adapt it quickly, trying to adapt it quickly. And you can choose your own two or three strategies, how you can focus on this part of speaking or that part of speaking. For example, if you want to uh, develop brainstorming skills, probably you don't need much. You just take you just take uh, tasks from uh, Yege speaking or uh, writing or from any other Cambridge test, and then uh, probably you could um, adapt it somehow to your to your class and to your learners' needs. Okay. Okay. This is it for today, I think. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, there is another section coming in 20 minutes from now, if you have registered, so I'll be there. And if not, if you don't know what I'm talking about, I'm sorry, good luck with your teaching and uh, uh, stay warm and healthy. Enjoy, enjoy the rest of your November and uh, a new year, new year is approaching. Bye for now, take care. I think this is it.